Good morning, and welcome to Central Presbyterian Church's online worship service for this Sunday, September 27th, 2020. I'm your lay reader, Zach Cosner. I welcome you to um, download the bulletin for today's service, which can be found in the link in the description of this video on Facebook and on YouTube, or you can head to our website, www.centralpresbyterianchurch.com, look for the publications link in the top, go ahead and scroll down to the bottom of the page until you see today's date, you can click on that and download today's PDF, uh, the PDF of today's bulletin, I apologize. Uh, now that you've uh, been able to download the bulletin for today's service, I ask that you turn your attention to the announcements on the back of that bulletin. Next Sunday is World Communion Sunday. We'll be taking up the Peace and Global Witness Offering. This provides tools and resources for the church as we join together as active peacemakers in, at all times and in all ways like the reconciliation work in South Sudan, international advocacy at the UN, or a peace camp for kids in New Jersey. Speaking of camps, Ferncliff Camp and Conference Center is now offering Advent in a Box for those who might be limited in their mobility during the COVID-19 pandemic. It provides four sessions of activities and supplies, one for each week of Advent. Uh, for more information, you can check out at their website, www.ferncliff.org. Archives of our online services can be found on Facebook and on YouTube. Links to each are on our website, www.centralprespb.com, where you can also find our online giving portal. Look for the Donate Now link at the top of the page. We will take credit cards, debit cards, and checks, and you can also set up recurring donations on a weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly basis. Let, our, let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship the Lord. The God of heaven has made his home on earth. Christ dwells among us and is one with us. Highest in all creation, he lives among the least. He journeys with the rejected and welcomes the weary. Come now, all who thirst, and drink the water of life. Come now, all who hunger, and be filled with good things. Come now, all who seek, and be warmed by the fire of love. Our God is a God of justice, waiting to be gracious to you, yearning to have pity on you. Blessed are all who wait for the Lord. In penitence and in faith, let us confess, confess our sins to Almighty God, first using the prayer printed in the bulletin and then silently. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. So we pray, O God, yet we confess our lives show forth little mercy. We pass judgment on people who think and live differently than we do. Suspicion, jealousy, and quarrels infect our relationships and keep us from building communities where everyone feels welcome and known. Merciful God, again we ask you for forgiveness. Teach us and guide us to extend to others what we have received so abund abundantly from you. Gracious acceptance, saving help, and love that binds us together. In Jesus' name we pray. And now silently. Amen. The good news in Christ is that when we face ourselves and God with the awareness of our need, we are given grace to grow, encouraged to continue the journey. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Now at this time, I ask the young and the young at heart to join Miss Rose for today's children's sermon. Good morning, everyone. I hope you've had a good week. Today we're going to talk again about Moses, but first we're going to play a game. How many of you have ever played the game Rock, Scissors, and Paper? You know, you put your hand out like this and you either, you go one, two, three, and you either make a rock, or a pair of scissors, or paper. And, you know, we know that scissors cut paper, paper covers rock, and rock can break the scissors. So, everybody can be a winner in this game. You know, I have some scissors and paper here. Well, you know, scissors can come in handy when you need to cut a piece of paper. 
and a paper can come in real handy when you need to write a letter. But other than that, they're not very useful. But a rock, well, we know what a rock can do. It can give us water when we're real thirsty. What? You don't believe me? Well, let me tell you a story. Of course, we know the Israelites were out in the desert, and when they got hungry, God provided food for them. But now they're thirsty. You know, when you're out in a desert, it's really hot out there. You get thirsty a lot. So the Israelites, of course, complained to Moses. You know, we're thirsty. There's no water here. What are we going to do? Can't, we can't cook. We can't do anything. And we're just really, really thirsty. So Moses went to God and said, God, what can we do or what can I do to provide water for the Israelites? So God told Moses to take his staff and to go to the mountainside and hit a big rock. And so that's what Moses did. And when he did, guess what happened? Water. Water came gushing out. So much water that there was enough for the Israelites to drink and to, to give their animals. Now, <clears throat> we know that sometimes things are impossible. We have to remember that anything, nothing is impossible with God. So keep that in mind the next time you're thirsty or you're hungry. Remember that God can do the impossible. And before I say a prayer today, I want to say a special prayer today for Scarlett and Dominique as they're facing some health problems. Let's remember them and, of course, all of you in our prayers this week. Let us pray. Dear God, we know that you can do the impossible. Help us to remember to ask you when we have times that are hard on us and things we think are impossible. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Ms. Rose, for that wonderful sermon. Uh, now we'll go ahead and turn it over to Reverend Tim Reeves for this week's sermon, Obedience School. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Our first reading this morning comes from the second chapter of Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, beginning with the first verse and proceeding through verse 13. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, have the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. 
Our second reading comes from the 21st chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, beginning with the 23rd verse and proceeding through verse 32. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom ahead of a uh, kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open now our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear, that hearing we might believe, and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service, glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. When, or were I asked to condense the mystery and majesty with which the Bible reveals our sovereign God, I would sum it up with just two simple words. I'm here. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. At the, new, at the end of the age, God will establish new heavens and a new earth where nothing accursed shall be found. And God's throne will be front and center in the midst of God's people. Likewise, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus' birth takes place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And Matthew concludes with our risen Lord's final words to his disciples. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. I'm here. God tells us in the person of Jesus Christ, I'm here. And that profound truth means two key things in Matthew's theology. It stands behind everything Jesus says and does. And it has a direct bearing on everything we say and do. I'm here, God tells us, in Jesus Christ. 
Not surprisingly, we learn that Jesus taught the people as one having authority and not as their scribes. We learn that Jesus could calm the raging wind and waves, that he could cast out evil spirits, that he could heal people of their infirmities and even raise them from the dead. We learn things that are like the, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath and that he could miraculously feed multitudes with five loaves and two fish, and that he could walk on water. Time and again, Jesus would criticize the religious leaders of his day for narrowly interpreting the law and misrepresenting God's will. And in Matthew's estimation, all of this settled the issue of our Lord's authority. I'm here, God tells us in Jesus Christ. Not surprisingly, our Lord spells out what is expected of all who call themselves his disciples. He teaches, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if any one, anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. Jesus said, you shall love your neighbor and as yourself. You, you shall love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that we might be children of our Father in heaven because God makes his Son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And then he asks, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? And he concludes by saying, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's how we as disciples of Jesus are to live under his authority. But the religious authorities of Jesus's day remained far from convinced. And so we are told that in this morning's lesson, they approached Jesus and asked him by what authority he was doing the things he was doing and who gave him this authority. What were those things in question? Well, the day before this particular encounter, Jesus had entered the city of Jer Jerusalem for the feast of Passover. And he had walked into the courts of the temple and had driven out all who were selling and buying in the temple. He had overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves and said to them, it is written, my house shall be a house a prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. In other words, Jesus represented a threat to everyone with a vested interest in the status quo. And so the religious leaders demanded to know what gave him the right to do what he had done. And his response in its own roundabout way is, I'm here. Rather than answering their question, he simply asks them, did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? They had opposed John the Baptist much as they now opposed Jesus. And they were quick to realize that if they answered from heaven, then they would be condemned for not believing him. But if they answered 
from human origin, then they would run the risk of infuriating the people who regarded John as a prophet. So they simply told Jesus that they didn't know. And Jesus responded, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. He turns the tables on them in the following parable that he tells, in which the first son is commanded to go and labor in the vineyard, but refuses, then later repents and goes to work in the vineyard, and in which the second son is commanded to go into the vineyard and initially says yes, but never goes. And Jesus asks, which of the two did the will of his father? Now, <clears throat> given the choice between the two, the answer is obvious. The first son, who initially said no, but later went to work. But we have to admit that we come to that conclusion rather grudgingly, because Jesus does not produce or present the truly ideal option. The example of the perfect son would be the one who said yes to the father and immediately carried out the father's will. But in this parable, neither son is ideal. Both are disobedient. Both are disrespectful. The only difference is that the first son repents of this disobedience and goes and works in the vineyard. And we must say in all honesty that the first son in the parable represents nothing more than the lesser of two evils. And it would therefore seem that Jesus has now set the stage for the chief priests and elders to revel in their superiority, to say in that holier-than-thou smugness, thank God we're not like those people. But the truth of the matter is that our Lord turns, as it turns out, was the only one who ever said yes and then carried out the Father's will. By what authority, Jesus, do you say and do these things? I'm here, he responds. And then he points out that far from being a shining example of the ideal son who could lord it over others, the tax collectors and prostitutes will enter the kingdom before the Pharisees and scribes and all other religious leaders who, in fact, were behaving more like the second son who said yes, but did not go and labor in the vineyard. Jesus says to them, in effect, you talk a good talk, but that's all it is. Where's your righteousness? Where's your faithfulness? Where's your obedience? And some of us may be tempted to say today, thank God we're not like the chief priests and elders. But as soon as we say that or think that, the tables are turned on us and we find ourselves in need of a refresher course in obedience. The sad fact of the matter is that the Church of Jesus Christ often talks a very good talk, but that's all we do. We talk about being an open, inclusive, and welcoming community, but watch what happens in too many congregations when someone who doesn't meet our unspoken preconditions suddenly appears. He doesn't look like me. She doesn't dress appropriately. They know absolutely nothing about the Bible. She doesn't think the, thing, the same things I think. He doesn't vote the way I vote. They really don't belong here. We talk a good talk about being a witnessing, serving, giving community. But watch what happens in too many congregations when self-interest trumps the interests of others. I don't want those people hanging around my church. 
we're barely able to pay our bills. How can we possibly think of giving to others? I'm tired and unappreciated. Let someone else do the work from now on. It's my way or the highway. I'll get around to helping others when I'm not so busy. Any of that sound familiar? We talk a good talk. At the pulpit, at the font, at the table, we affirm God's gracious claim on and loving providence in our lives. Our creeds and confessions expound and summarize our faith. Our worship renders all honor and glory to God. But actions speak louder than words. And unless the Church of Jesus Christ is following the example of God's perfect Son, who indeed said yes to God's will and then carried out that will, how will the world know that we are Christians? As a child, I remember singing, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. And I think it's just that simple. In her book, Out of Africa, Isaac Dennison tells the story of a young boy named Kital who appeared at Dennison's door one day and asked for a job. She immediately hired him, but is surprised when he approaches her just three months later and asks her for a letter of recommendation to Sheikh Ali bin Salim, a Muslim living in a nearby town. Dennison offers to raise Katal's pay in order to keep him, but he's not interested in more money. He explains that he has decided to become either a Christian or a Muslim. And his purpose in working for Dennison had been to see up close and personal the ways of Christians. And now he wanted to go observe the sheikh to see how Muslims behaved. Then he would make his decision. To which Dennison replies, good God, Katal, you might have told me that when you came here. I take that story to mean that it is one thing to confess with our lips that we live in the midst of an ever-present God. It's quite another thing to live a life that confesses that faith as well. Who knows who may be looking at us at this very moment, wondering how Christians live. Paul echoes that very sentiment in his exhortation to the church in Philippi when he says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in Humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Pulsating <clears throat> in the background of those verses is the message of our Savior. I'm here. Paul then describes what that means for us by singing the praises of Christ's self-emptying love and placing that same self-emptying love before us as the pattern we are to emulate. It's a lesson in obedience. It's a call to faithfulness. It's an invitation to go and work in the Father's vineyard. How will we respond? To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen. I would ask now at this time that you would please join me and confirm what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed that can be found in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now return to God our thanksgiving through our tithes and offerings, which are being taken again electronically this week. Please head to our website, www.centralprespb.com, and click on the Donate Now link, and please submit your tithe. If you wish not to submit the tithe electronically, feel free to mail a check to the church. Our address is 6300 Trinity Drive, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, 71603. Let us pray. It is right and our greatest joy to give you thanks, eternal God, for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. But we are most grateful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and for your abiding and sustaining Holy Spirit. For our Lord reconciled us to you and to one another, opening the door to eternal life. Your Holy Spirit continues to confront us, convict us, correct us, and equip us to enter the world and share the good news of your redeeming grace. And so, O oh God, we offer up our time, our talents, our treasures, and indeed our very selves for you to use as you see fit. Until that most glorious day, when at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bend, and, and every tongue shall confess him, Lord, to your honor and glory. Amen. At this time, let us share our joyous concerns, which there are several. Um, I was asked in the uh, chat room to, uh, for the following. Um, first, uh, we'll, we will mention uh, Brad Von Tunglin. Um, please continue to pray for his healing. Um, he uh, received a, an upsetting report from the surgeon. Um, he needs to have his uh, kidneys go into remission and for him to lose the fluid before they can um, uh, take care of the uh, other underlying issues that, that is causing Brad so much pain. So please continue to keep Brad in your prayers. Uh, please keep Dominic Munn in your prayers. Uh, he went to the cardiologist this past week and received um, an updated medication uh, schedule. Uh, if the medications don't handle the, uh, the problems that he's currently having with his heart, uh, they will have to uh, schedule a surgery in the coming weeks. Um, if the meds work, they'll have to, they will be able to postpone that surgery uh, for some time. Uh, we'll also ask prayers for Scarlett, Dominic's sister. Um, she had a, um, a visit with the orthopedic uh, doctor, and there is uh, issues that, with her back that they're going to have to return to that doctor for uh, in the coming days. So please keep Scarlett in your prayers. Um, we were asked to keep Kathy Griffin, a sister of uh, Ms. Riegler's, um, in your prayers. Uh, she had returned to the hospital after um, with complications uh, stemming from her recent heart surgery. Uh, she is back home now and resting. Um, we uh, continue to pray, pray for Ms. Griffin's um, healing. Uh, we uh, as were asked to keep Thomas Porter in our prayers, who is the father of Dana Neal. Uh, we were asked to keep Kara Taylor in our prayers. Uh, she's recovering from her fourth brain surgery. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we were asked to keep the uh, family of Sheila Horn's great niece and her, uh, her great niece's husband um, in our prayers. Uh, her, uh, Sheila's great niece and husband were uh, tragically killed in an automobile accident in Odessa, Texas, where he, uh, where the husband served as an associate pastor at a church there. Uh, three small children who were also in the vehicle survived the accident. Uh, we pray for uh, mercies for those children and uh, comfort and caring in the coming days for the entire family. Um, uh, I'm asking for prayer for my aunt Brenda Greenham. Uh, she is uh, she's gone through a um, a period of having cancer. Uh, she is uh, on her final round of chemo. She's currently cancer free. Um, her last round of chemo will uh, be completed sometime, I believe, in December. Um, and she is also having a um, a minor surgery um, on the 30th this Wednesday. Uh, so please keep uh, my aunt Brenda Greenham in your prayers. And um, 
I would also like to keep the family of Don Rigney in our prayers. Um, Don Rigney was a co-worker of mine. Uh, he worked with me at the Department of Corrections here in Pine Bluff before he transferred to our parole and probation side um, at the Omega um, uh, Arkansas Correctional School um, on the grounds of Washita Regional Unit in Malvern. Um, Don contracted COVID-19 about uh, two and a half weeks ago, and unfortunately, um, uh, Don passed away uh, this past Friday from the disease. So please keep uh, his family in your prayers. Um, we also ask that you uh, continue to keep those, all of those who have lost loved ones to this horrible disease, uh, COVID-19, um, in our uh, prayers. Uh, we also uh, ask that you keep those who are dealing with it on a daily basis, our first responders, medical professionals, um, and our retail workers in your prayers. Um, we continue to ask for prayer for our nation and pray for the reconciliation of, of all of us to the Lord here in, in the U.S. and around the world. Let us pray. Holy and gracious Father, we give you thanks that the Lord Jesus Christ is in fact the same today as he was yesterday and will be for all of our tomorrows. We ask that you hold the family of Sheila Horn's great niece and her husband in your caring. It is a tragedy and a, and a very sad, sad time for them, but know that you are there with, with them and that you are, you are guiding their healing and their, and their comfort and uh, you are with them as well. Oh, let please be with uh, Brenda Greenham, Kathy Griffin, Kara Taylor, Thomas Porter, Scarlett Munn, Dominic Munn, and Brad Von Tunglen as they each uh, take on their own medical issues. Please be, uh, please guide the doctors who are caring for those people. Uh, give that those doctors and nurses the wisdom and the um, ability to be able to handle those um, medical issues and to, and please place your curing hair, a uh, hand, excuse me, your curing hand on those people and uh, continue to provide a protection over them. Please be with those who have lost loved ones to COVID-19, including the family of Don Rigney. Uh, please let them know that you were there for them during this terrible time. Please continue to be with those who are dealing with COVID-19 on a daily basis, be it our medical, uh, uh, medical people, our doctors and our nurses, our EMTs. Um, please be with our, uh, our um, retail workers and those who have to deal with the public on, the day, on a daily basis. Please keep your care and uh, protection around those as well. And finally, please heal our nation and our world. It is a very distressing time there is much angst and worry and anger that is happening amongst brothers and sisters in this country and in this world. And we ask that you reconcile all of us to you, O Lord, for, for you, is the, are, you are the divine, uh, divine knower of things and you are the way and the light. We ask that you, uh, that you provide cl uh, clarity and healing to our nation and our world. Give us hope as we strive to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now go out into the world in peace to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit. Taking today's message with you and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.